If I could ask folks to um, take a seat so we can get started, try and say uh, relatively on time, that would be great. Good afternoon and welcome. I am Ruth Katz, Executive Director of the Health Medicine and Society Program here at the Aspen Institute. And we're delighted that you have joined us for our second Public Health Grand Round session. We could not have asked for a more timely talk nor a speaker more knowledgeable on the subject. But before I introduce today's session, let me just take a moment to tell you a little bit about the series. Many of you know that Grand Rounds is a time-honored feature of medicine designed to keep clinicians up to date about scientific and medical advances and to promote excellence in research and practice. This year, we are borrowing from that tradition to advance knowledge about the cutting edge public health issues of the day. Public Health Grand Rounds is a partnership between two Aspen programs, the one I work for, medicine, Health Medicine and Society, which has a domestic focus, and Global Health and Development, which of course works on international health issues. This series is made possible with funding from the Aspen Innovation Fund, for which of course we are most grateful. We expect to schedule Grand Rounds four to six times a year, taking full advantage of our prime location here in Washington to engage individual thinkers and doers in the field. This is an invitation-only event, and we've asked you to join us because we believe you can take the forward-focused ideas you'll be hearing about and spread them further. We are live streaming this event, and a videotape will be up on our website within the next 24 hours, so please feel free to share it with colleagues or to watch it again yourselves. And now it's my great pleasure to introduce a man who actually needs little or no introduction, Dr. Thomas Frieden, Director of the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. Frieden's talk, Ebola and Global Health Security, will take us into the heart of the most recent infectious disease scare. I know he will be reminding us that microbes have no respect for national borders, which means that this is not only a moral imperative, but an act of self-interest to respond effectively to outbreaks around the world. Dr. Frieden has directed the CDC since June of 2009. In those years, he has dealt with, in addition to Ebola, H1N1 flu, avian flu, MRSA, and no doubt many other infectious agents that have never reached the front pages. He has also been involved in global efforts to eradicate polio and to control multi-drug resistant tuberculosis. Of course, his responsibilities to advance the public health go beyond all of that. He's played especially important roles in tobacco control and obesity prevention. Dr. Frieden spent his early career as a disease detective in the CDC's EIS service. Later, as commissioner of the New York City Health Department, he directed efforts that cut teen smoking in half and helped that city become the first in the U.S. to eliminate trans fats from, resist from restaurant menus. Somewhere in the middle of all that, he has also managed to publish some 200 scientific articles and to become fluent in Spanish. Dr. Frieden earned both his medical degree and a master's degree in public health from Columbia University and completed his infectious disease training at Yale. Dr. Frieden, thanks so much for being here, especially at this uh, very, very busy time. Dr. Tom Frieden. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ruth, and thanks so much to the Aspen Institute for uh, arranging this, bringing us together. I'm going to go through a fairly large number of slides because I want to get a lot of information out there, but I also want to do two other things. One, leave plenty of time for questions and discussion at the end. And two, remember to leave you with what I think is the single most important concept that I'll be sharing. And that is that infectious diseases are here to stay, but we can make a difference. We can control them and push them back if we focus on three fundamental principles. First, finding threats when they first emerge. Second, responding effectively. And third, having learned from those two activities, preventing them wherever possible. And that key formulation of finding, stopping, and preventing is going to be essential to every aspect of our infectious disease control measures. Now, CDC works 24-7 to save lives, protect people, and save money through prevention. <clears throat> we have at CDC more than 12,000 uh, health professionals who work to find, stop, and prevent health threats. 
We analyze health information in the U.S. and around the world, and most of the data that you'll see coming out on health in the U.S. comes from CDC in one way or another. Uh, but we also work with individuals, with communities, and with healthcare workers to implement strategies to respond and prevent. We also serve <coughs> as the de facto uh, uh, reference laboratory for the world, and CDC has more than 200, uh, about 150 different laboratories. Uh, we have over 2,000 laboratory scientists working on a broad range of areas, in infectious diseases, environmental health, bioterrorism, and more. And we have important partnerships all around the world. In fact, CDC has uh, staff in 60 countries. We had staff in Mali before the current cluster, and I'll talk about that more in a moment. We also uh, have a variety of programs that we work around the world with. And again, that basic concept of finding, stopping, and preventing is how you can think about our different programs. We have programs in influenza, so we can track how strains spread around the world and what's the best choice for our vaccine here in the U.S. We have programs in immunization, where we work very closely with the World Health Organization. Measles immunization over the past decade has saved more than 10 million lives and is responsible in and of itself for more than a quarter of all of the increase uh, or for all of the decrease in infant mortality, all of the increase in child survival. Immunization programs are best buys in this country and globally and critically important. We also work on malaria control with the President's Malaria Initiative, and we embed staff into ministries of health where that program is operational. Not dissimilar to what we do in this country, where we embed our staff, CDC staff, into state and local health departments. We don't establish large CDC offices all over the country. Rather, we strengthen the systems in place, whether that's in uh, um, hospitals, hospital systems to support them for better infection control or public health departments. We do the same thing globally, working with ministries of health and with partners. And of course, the PEPFAR program, which is the largest bilateral global health program there has ever been, and which has been remarkably successful. CDC provides about half of all of the treatment and the prevention of mother-to-child transmission work in PEPFAR. And in fact, in the Ebola response, the infrastructure established by PEPFAR has been very important in helping to enable us to respond quickly and flexibly. Perhaps the single most important thing we do in global health is a program called the Field Epidemiology Training Program. This is based on the CDC Epidemic Intelligence Service Program, a two-year program where you take a highly trained physician or veterinarian or dentist or nurse or pharmacist or PhD and over the next two years, you train them to do a very specific style of field epidemiology. You train them to assess a surveillance system and see if it's accurate. You train them to identify an outbreak and stop it. You train them to embed with a local health entity and help them respond to an urgent health threat. That program has been the backbone of CDC for more than 60 years. And now for decades, we've been helping other countries do a similar type of epidemiology training. And we now have trained over 3,000 epidemiologists from around the world. This is a two-year in-country training program. 80% of the graduates stay in country, generally working in positions of leadership. So this is a suite of programs that allows CDC to strengthen governments, public health systems, healthcare systems around the world for their sake and for ours. And over the past decade, we've had to respond to a large uh, a number of emergencies, natural events, infectious diseases, potential environmental contamination, and more. And for the past over two years, we've been discussing the issue of global health security because we are truly connected by airplane flights, by food supply, by air, by water. And to a very great extent, our vulnerability depends on how vulnerable other parts of the world are. Now, we have three major risks that we face in global health security. The first are emerging organisms, as Ebola emerged in West Africa for the first time ever. The second are resistant organisms, and I'll speak more about that toward the end of this talk. And the third, unfortunately, are intentionally created organisms. The same technological advances that allow us to do more faster would allow someone 
with malicious intent to create organisms that may be difficult to deal with. But we have three opportunities that really give us a lot of hope and momentum here. The first is that there is a public health framework for responding to health security threats. That framework works. It's committed to by every country. There's an evaluation system to assess it. And second, there are real technological advances. So now we're able to do rapid testing, for example, for the plague bacteria in just 20 minutes with a dipstick that looks like a urine test or a pregnancy dipstick. That test is in clinical trials in Africa today and has already been used to rapidly detect and as a result able to treat and prevent outbreaks from plague. So there are technological improvements not just in laboratory work but also in informatics and in communications technologies. And third, there are success stories. Whether it's China's successful containment of H7N9, very different from what happened with SARS a decade earlier, or Thailand setting up a system by which they can uh, track and stop flu, or the global collaboration in response to a variety of threats. We have successes. And that leads us to the goal of prevention, detection, and response. Uh, the global air network is quite striking, uh, and we are ever more connected. Uh, interestingly, West Africa is closer to Europe than it is to East Africa or Southern Africa. But uh, I think in many uh, quarters, there is a little bit of a conflation of what is Africa, what is West, West Africa. The West African countries that have been heavily affected by Ebola are struggling and beginning to show proof of principle that we can stop it. We have a long way to go there. Global health security is something that we've committed to for several years. We implemented pilot programs in 2013. Those pilot programs showed uh, real success and promise. And one in Uganda, for example, was able to result in very rapid detection of outbreaks of meningitis, of cholera, of Marburg virus, and allow very rapid response. Our goal in 2014 uh, has been to implement, together with the Department of Defense in 10 countries, programs to advance this prevention detection response framework. In 2015, uh, we're hopeful that with the emergency uh, request of the President, we're able to really begin to close some of the blind spots to, to address some of the weak links that make vulnerabilities around the world our vulnerabilities. And the commitment uh, is that by 2020, we will have 30 countries with at least 4 billion people effectively prevented, uh, protected against another outbreak. The approach is very straightforward. It's again that prevention detection response framework. And prevention uh, we start with biosecurity and biosafety, making sure that laboratories are safe so that organisms don't unintentionally or intentionally get out and infect laboratory workers and escape to the community. Immunization programs, which are a tremendously effective way not only of promoting health, but of reducing health <coughs> risks that may spread more broadly. And nothing could make that more apparent than what we've been dealing with with measles over the past uh, uh, couple of years where outbreaks anywhere in the world result often in outbreaks here. Measles is very highly infectious. Um, we also are focusing on surveillance for zoonotic disease in humans. About three quarters of all newly emerging infections come from some part of the zoonotic world, some part of the animal kingdom. And we still don't have a handle on the uh, natural reservoir of Ebola. But studies are underway now so we can understand that better and prevent future events where Ebola would be introduced into a society. On the prevention front, there's also antimicrobial resistance prevention. And that means both antibiotic stewardship, which I'll talk more about, but also identifying and stopping the spread of resistant organisms. On detection, critically important that we monitor to detect threats early. What a different world we would be in today if these basic systems had been in place in West Africa a year ago. It doesn't take much to identify a cluster of people with a hemorrhagic illness. It's a very unusual disease. It doesn't take that much to do laboratory testing for it. It does take a lot to stop it, even if it's very small. 
and it takes an enormous amount to stop it if it's become epidemic, which is what, hap what has happened now. But that means having information systems. That means having disease detectives, people who've been through a training like the field epidemiology training course I mentioned. And then response capacity. And response capacity means having an incident management system with an emergency operations center. Uh, this is fundamentally how we organize to respond to an emergency. And for the global health security work, we have the metric, key metric, that every country and every subnational area within countries should be able to activate their emergency operations center and respond within two hours to a threat. If you can do that, you can cut the time out of, uh, uh, out of steps and you can respond much more effectively and prevent things from getting as out of control as Ebola has gotten now. Now to talk about Ebola for a minute, uh, we look at different infectious disease threats, and Ebola is scary. It's scary because of its case fatality rate, which is generally in the 50 to 70 percent uh, range. We think that with meticulous clinical care, we should be able to get that down substantially, addressing hydration and fluid management, but it's still a very deadly disease. Compare that with things like SARS, which is around 10 percent, or MERS, which as far as we know is about a third, or even the 1918 pandemic, which was about 2%, 1 to 2% in those uh, who had infected, the, the case fatality rate, as we call it in public health, is high. But that doesn't mean that it has anything like the epidemic potential of influenza, because one of the fundamental facts about um, Ebola is that from everything we have seen, it only spreads from someone who is ill, and it only spreads from direct contact with body fluids of someone who's ill or someone who has died. So the spread has been primarily by these two routes, unsafe caregiving, whether in the home or in healthcare facilities, and in Africa, unsafe burials, where burial practices may, may promote the widespread transmission of disease. Now, the bottom line with Ebola is that despite recent progress, the epidemic remains severe that core public health interventions can stop it, and that success requires speed and scale deploying effective prevention and control resources. Now, I think there are three overarching principles that are essential to the response. The first is speed. The second is flexibility. And the third is keeping the front lines first. Just to mention speed for a moment, uh, models constructed by CDC epidemiologists indicated that even a one-month delay in scaling up services to respond to Ebola could result in a tripling of the size of the outbreak. And that's why we've been working around the clock for the past four to six months. And that's why we've been working around the clock for the past three days, surging people into Mali to deal with the cluster there, which I'll talk about more in a minute. Flexibility is very important. The incubation time of Ebola is 2 to 21 days, but the usual incubation time is about 8 to 10 days. That means that every week and a half, there's another generation of cases. And you've got to be ready to respond wherever it's most needed. The front lines first is a key concept. Staff uh, who are working in West Africa continue to be frustrated by the lack of simple things that would be very helpful in response. CDC has 170 staff on the ground now in West Africa. It's the largest global response in our history. And we've been aided enormously by our partnership with the DOD, with USAID, and their DART process, or Disaster Assistance Response Team process. But despite all of the good wishes, still we deal with things like the need to get into a village that's so remote that not even helicopters can get us there or to take dugout canoes to get to a place where there's a cluster of cases, or to hike four hours through a forested area to get to a diamond mine where we find not just a cluster of Ebola, but 20,000 people living and working around that diamond mine, and where if we don't get in and get specimens out, we may have a cluster of hundreds or even thousands of cases. So those are the three key principles that we try to uh, ensure adherence to. The way to think about the Ebola outbreak, I think, is as a forest fire, or analogous to a forest fire. At the center are Liberia, Sierra Leone, and Guinea, which have, uh, in various different parts of their country, 
bushfires all over, widespread. The first time the world has ever had an epidemic of Ebola, spreading widely throughout countries, spreading to multiple countries. But around them are the sparks that emerge from that forest fire, and that might land in Lagos, Nigeria, or Bamako, Mali, or Senegal. And each of those sparks has the potential to create another set of wildfires, another forest fire, unless it's rapidly extinguished by intensive effort. And just to give you a sense of how intensive that effort needs to be, in Nigeria, when a, an ill traveler went from uh, Liberia to Lagos and was so ill he had to be carried off the plane, uh, he went to a local hospital. His Ebola diagnosis was initially not suspected. And pretty soon, uh, there was a cluster of cases in Lagos. At CDC, we had staff on the ground who were working on polio eradication in Nigeria, <laughs> as well as the PEPFAR program and malaria work. We could bring staff from other parts of Africa. And within 48 hours, we put 10 of our top staff on the ground in Lagos. We were able to help the government repurpose their polio infrastructure to manage the Lagos outbreak. We were able to take 40 of the trainees that we had uh, helped become disease detectives to deal with polio, Nigerian doctors, and reallocate their work to Ebola control. And over the following weeks, they identified 899 contacts. They did 19,000 home visits to monitor for fever. They constructed an Ebola treatment unit. They trained more than 2,000 healthcare workers in Ebola prevention and control. They got more than 95% of their contacts monitored every day. They missed one. That one contact went to another city called Port Harcourt and started another cluster of Ebola there. They had to repeat the operation there, creating an emergency operations center, training staff, creating treatment facilities. But with all of that intensive work, they were able to stop the outbreak. And from that importation event, Nigeria is now Ebola free. That's the effort it took to prevent one case of Ebola from becoming an outbreak or epidemic. And given how central Nigeria is to African travel and transit, it was crucial to do that. That's the struggle we are today engaged in in Mali. Uh, and then beyond that second ring of countries that may have an immediate ember or spark that, that ignites an outbreak, every other country that has the potential to have Ebola or other deadly infectious diseases needs to become more fire resistant. And fire resistance in the case of infectious disease control means detection systems, so you find things early, response systems, so you can respond effectively, and prevention, those same three principles. In Ebola control, we have five basic principles. Incident management, organizing our system so that it's efficient. Last week, we ensured that uh, Mali had appointed an incident manager, and we are now scaffolding around that individual to provide as effective incident management as possible. Treatment in Mali, the government of Mali had created an Ebola treatment unit to provide isolation and care. And now they have one, one confirmed and two suspected patients in that Ebola treatment unit, which is currently being staffed by Doctors Without Borders from Spain, MSF Spain. Burial support, and in uh, parts of Africa, burial traditions are very different from here and involve washing the body, touching the body, sometimes whole villages touching bodies to pay respect. It's their way of grieving. It needs to change to protect people from Ebola. But that means change in communities that are very widely dispersed, which don't have a lot of trust, often, of the government and society, which may be cut off without internet, cell phone, even radio coverage with the rest of the world. So it's a challenge. Fourth is infection control in the entire healthcare system. We have to ensure that the whole healthcare system in these three West African countries is ready to consider Ebola, and that's not easy because it initially prevents, presents quite a bit like malaria. And these are countries that are hyper-endemic for malaria. The rate of malaria infection in these countries is in the range of 20, 40, 50, 60, even 70 percent in different communities. So where you have something that's very common and looks a lot like something that's a lot less common but a lot more deadly to the healthcare workers, you have to have an overarching change in the way infection control is done. And finally, communication, to get all of this through to healthcare workers and to the public. 
CDC has, as I mentioned, the largest global response in our history, and it's addressing all aspects of the response in conjunction with our U.S. and global partners. That includes addressing the needs in each of the countries. And though the, uh, many of the U.S. efforts are focused on Liberia, the CDC efforts are actually in every country where there are cases. We actually have more staff in Sierra Leone than in Liberia because the needs are greater there at the moment. In Sierra Leone, the British government has come in in a big way with assistance and we're working very closely with the UK to provide the kind of information and feedback uh, and uh, guidance and partnership that is most effective. Uh, but everything from laboratory testing to communications expertise to contact tracing to outbreak control to logistics are things that CDC along with USAID, WHO and others uh, and the Department of Defense, which has come in in a very big way, in a very helpful way, are doing. Now, there has been, there have been some encouraging trends in some parts of each of the three countries. And I believe those encouraging trends are fundamentally proof of principle that we can still stop Ebola. But I've heard at times some sense of, oh, the problem's over already. And I'm very concerned by that perspective because it's nowhere near over. It's going to be a very long, hard fight because every single one of those cases that's emerging, and they're now uh, many hundreds, probably more than a thousand cases a week emerging in uh, West Africa, every one of those cases needs that kind of response that I described for Lagos, Nigeria. Uh, and that is going to be incredibly difficult. So we have a long way to go. And just to give you a sense of how far we have to go, a reminder that cases are still growing. Despite some progress, there were more cases in West Africa uh, in October than there were in September. And though the numbers decreased somewhat in Liberia, we believe, there's still so many cases that we're not able to do the kind of outbreak control that's needed. And there's so many communities that have not yet had cases and that need intensive control measures. In fact, in October, West Africa had more Ebola cases than in all other recorded Ebola outbreaks over the last 40 years combined. So we have a long way to go, but we do have proof of principle, and we do have tremendous commitment from societies. My team in <coughs> Liberia was describing how many communities themselves were taking action. They're remote, services haven't gotten there, so they identified buildings or schools to isolate and care for people with Ebola. They tracked the contacts so that they would be rapidly isolated and wouldn't further spread disease. So there's a lot of progress. I did want to share with you, this is actually outdated because it's from yesterday. Um, and I had an updated slide from this morning, uh, but we didn't have a chance to put it in yet. One additional case has been confirmed. And this is just an example of the kind of rapid assessment that we're doing for the Malian cluster. One individual, 70-year-old man, the grand imam of Kuremale, uh, became ill and died. It was not understood that he had Ebola, and in all likelihood he did. Uh, in all likelihood, he may have gotten it by performing some of those funeral rites that were mentioned, but he was the grand imam of a large town that is literally uh, on the border between Guinea and Mali. Somebody said to me, you mean like Kansas City? I said, well, yeah, kind of, but not in a lot of other ways. <laughs> uh, but it is a, a, a town that straddles two countries. And um, when he became ill, he had other conditions. He was taken to three different healthcare facilities. And then he had a large funeral service. And in those healthcare facilities, he was cared for in his family. He was cared for by individuals who have since been confirmed to have had Ebola. The team there has now identified more than 450 contacts, and they've undertaken contact tracing to track those individuals, ideally every day for 21 days, so that the moment anyone gets sick, they get isolated. We expect people to get sick because there's flu, there's malaria, there's typhoid, there's other febrile conditions, and an indicator of this system working is that people will be brought in to the Ebola treatment unit and tested. We were already had two tested negative, when you have a negative test, you have to repeat it 72 hours after symptom onset because early on, there's so little virus that the individual is not infectious, but they also can't be diagnosed in some cases. Uh, this is just a map of, uh, of what happened. 
Uh, you can see on the border, Kurumale, and then the travel to, uh, to, to Bamako. Uh, one of the things that we do uh, is to help countries establish exit screening so that every person who leaves uh, is screened, their temperature is taken, they're asked a series of questions. And in this process, over the past few months, we've identified more than 80 people who've had fever and they've not flown because they had fever. In many cases, they actually didn't even enter the airport because the screening is done at the airport entrance. And that temperature is often retaken several times by the airlines or others as a way of keeping febrile people off air airplanes. Now, we also have looked at that second and third ring of preparedness. And this is a slide uh, uh, created, I believe, before the Malian uh, cluster. And you can kind of see uh, that there's Roughly speaking, some green. We've got laboratory capacity in most of the countries. Uh, some of them, it's challenging. Um, but there's a whole lot of red, emergency response capacity, and there's even more yellow, where we're not there yet. And that's why the emergency funding request is so critically important. Because today, or yesterday, or tomorrow, there could be another exposure, like the exposure in Mali, and we'll be dealing with another potential outbreak. And every one of these countries has the risk of either being like Lagos and controlling that spark, or like the next Liberia or Sierra Leone with widespread transmission throughout the society. And that kind of widespread transmission doesn't just harm people from Ebola. It really cripples the healthcare system. The healthcare system is basically closed. People don't come in for vaccines. They don't come in for treatment of malaria. Women who need emergency obstetrical care don't come forward for it. People who have car crashes and are bleeding are not cared for in some circumstances because people are afraid it might be Ebola. And the effects on society more generally are also devastating. Schools are closed. The economies are suffering severely. Crops are either not being planted or harvested to the extent that they could be otherwise. So the Ebola epidemic in West Africa has impacts far beyond, beyond Ebola and far beyond the health system. But there's also progress. Uh, this is a woman I met in uh, Liberia. She lives on the Firestone uh, uh, rubber plantation. Uh, Firestone had a cluster of Ebola. They went to the government and they said, help us. The government said, we can't, we're too busy. So the Firestone people said, okay, where can we learn how to do it ourselves? They said, you better talk to MSF, Doctors Without Borders. They did. They created their own Ebola treatment unit. They monitored every one of their contacts, and they were able to stop the spread of Ebola for their population of 55,000 people living on the largest rubber plantation in the world. And this is uh, one of the survivors of that effort. So in the US, there are a series of things that we're doing to strengthen our preparedness against Ebola. Screening and monitoring of travelers when they leave affected countries and when they arrive in the US. When they arrive in the US, their temperature is taken again. Detailed information is taken about their contact so that uh, local and state health departments can monitor them for 21 days in case they become ill. And they're provided with a care package, uh, check and report Ebola. And that care package has a thermometer, a fever log, health information, a wallet card, a number to call if they get sick. And over the past couple of weeks, uh, at least four people have gotten sick. They've taken their temperature, they've had a fever, they've called that number. The state health department has arranged for safe transport of the individual from where they are to a hospital that's ready and waiting for them. And all four of them ruled out for Ebola, but they were cared for safely in that system. Um, yesterday, uh, we uh, notified people that starting today, we'll be doing that same kind of active monitoring for everyone arriving from Mali not because we believe there's widespread transmission in Mali today, but because there are so many contacts there and we're not yet confident that those contacts are all being identified and monitored daily. So if one comes here, we don't want to take the risk that they might become ill and then the healthcare system would not be aware of their illness in time. Uh, we don't know that we have the perfect response, but like everything in public health, everything in clin clinical medicine, and everything in science, we use data to continuously improve practices. That's the approach we take, and that's the approach we'll continue to take. We've also worked with the healthcare system to strengthen infection control, to think Ebola earlier, to provide 
uh, assistance in the form of what are called uh, rep teams or uh, rapid Ebola preparedness teams which have now visited more than three dozen hospitals all over the country in a dozen states to assess whether they're ready to care for an Ebola patient, to make sure that they're linked up with a laboratory. We've now got more than 30 laboratories around the country that CDC has trained and supplied with partnership from the DOD, which has provided the assays, so that they can do tests for Ebola. It used to be only CDC and the U.S. AMRID could do tests in the U.S. Now we have more than 30 laboratories that can in the public health system. And the rep team will look very closely at whether the hospital is ready and what more they need to do to, to, to get ready. Um, now, in the emergency budget request, um, the funds requested are divided into, on the one hand, immediate, and on the other hand, contingency. The immediate uh, request um, is divided into three parts, domestic, Ebola, and a broader global health security component. For the CDC aspects of that request, it's a request of $1.83 billion, divided almost equally between those three components of domestic preparedness, Ebola-specific work in West Africa, and global health security work. This is absolutely critical. Uh, we have currently a $30 million stopgap uh, funding that expires on December 11th. Uh, that money is all committed. It allowed us to keep going at the level at which we're going, but not to scale up and ramp up to do the kind of outbreak control needed, or to stop and make all those yellow and red boxes green for the surrounding countries. If we don't do that, uh, we can't with confidence say that we'll be able to make the next outbreak the next Lagos and not the next Liberia. Now, global health security is something we've been working on for some time, and that whole framework of prevention, detection, and response has clear parallels with the Ebola work. In fact, there's tremendous synergy between preparing for Ebola and preparing for other health threats. And I think it would be irresponsible of us with scarce dollars not to ensure that we stretch them as far as possible so that we're addressing Ebola, but also if we happen to get loss of fever next time, we haven't not prepared, we haven't, we've prepared for that as well. So the, the approach really is uh, prevention through, in the case of uh, Ebola, things like infection control, biosafety more broadly, uh, in terms of detection, uh, laboratory, disease surveillance, and a trained workforce who can find Ebola or the next health threat that uh, may be unexpected from an unexpected part of the world and to respond effectively. Now, I want to, before closing, just talk about a little bit more than just Ebola because though uh, Ebola has been pretty all-consuming for many of us for a long time, there's a lot else going on. In 2014, Congress uh, approved our top priority ask at CDC, and that was something called Advanced Molecular Detection. Uh, funding to do something that's quite exciting, to be able to go into what it's called sometimes um, next generation sequencing. Next generation sequencing, instead of growing up an organism in the laboratory and then analyzing its genetic code, we actually take the sample itself, sputum or blood or other clinical specimen, and we can look into that sample to understand in a much different way, a much deeper way, what's actually happening with that infection. And we don't know what's going to come out of this. We think we can get more rapid diagnostics of infections, of drug resistance, perhaps identify what are the strains that are spreading more. It may change the way we understand uh, certain infections. There may be co-infections of multiple organisms. Or the substrain that grows really well in the laboratory may not actually be the strain that's making someone the sickest when we get that actual specimen data. So uh, that's all interesting theoretically, but what does it mean practically? It means that we can save lives, we can save money, and we can save time. We can cut time out of outbreak detection and response and make outbreaks smaller. That's the promise, but we need to continue to invest in it, work hard and work smart. I had the pleasure of walking through a poster session at CDC where we had dozens of laboratories and epidemiologic groups around CDC thinking through how to apply this to their work. Perhaps there are uh, cases that were considered to be unrelated, but actually are part of a cluster. Or in another disease, there's something that we assumed was one outbreak, and it turns out 
it was multiple different outbreaks, each of which had different sources and needed different interventions. So this is a very exciting new way of combining traditional epidemiology with uh, genetic sequencing, uh, bioinformatics that needs to be incredibly powerful to achieve this advanced molecular detection. Even one of our rapid sequencing machines in one two-hour run can create enough data to overload a hundred computers. So the amount of data that's coming out of it and the need to analyze that thoughtfully is, is uh, well, mind-boggling. Uh, we think that over the five years of this initiative will transform the way we do uh, genetic epidemiology and epidemiologic investigations for some of our conditions. Being able to identify things sooner, finding diagnostics that can um, make a diagnosis in a shorter period of time, helping states uh, implementing sustainable systems and developing more predictive modeling measures. New technologies don't take the place of careful analytic work. They may point in a direction where we can be more fruitful in our analytic work, but they don't take the place of that really thoughtful, complicated work. And fundamentally, that will lead to better detection, better surveillance. Now, one of the things that we need to look at closely is antimicrobial resistance. In the US and globally, we're seeing an inexorable rise in drug resistance. Faster for some organisms, faster in some parts of the world. And last year, for the first time, CDC did uh, an overarching report on drug resistance. We identified that there were more than two million drug-resistant infections in the U.S. each year, even conservatively estimated, and more than 23,000 deaths. In addition, there were 14,000 people who died related to C. difficile, which is a complication of antibiotic use. So this is a serious health problem. Uh, as an infectious disease physician myself, I've treated patients for whom uh, there are no modern medicines. It's a horrible and helpless feeling for physicians, for patients, and for families. And it reflects the fact that for some patients and some organisms, we're not in the pre-antibiotic era, we're not in the antibiotic era, we're in a post-antibiotic era. And unless we take urgent action, a greater proportion of infections will be difficult, if not impossible, to treat with modern medicines. And it's not just about treatment of infections because um, routine infections like pneumonia, urinary tract infections might become very difficult to treat. We're tracking one particular organism called CRE or carbapenem resistant enterobacteriaceae and that organism can be resistant to all antibiotics and currently it's mostly in hospitals. But if it spreads out to the community then routine urinary tract infections may become extremely difficult to treat. But it's not only the infections themselves. Treatment of infection has become an integral part of modern medical care, whether that's cancer chemotherapy, transplant, treatment of arthritis, um, joint replacement, complex surgery, dialysis. All of these things depend on the ability to rescue patients when their immune system is low with effective antibiotics. In fact, uh, more than 600,000 Americans will get cancer chemotherapy uh, this year. Uh, about 60,000 of them will be infected with, uh, will be hospitalized with a, uh, a serious infection that's a complication of their chemotherapy. And one in 14 of those may die from that complication. The more resistant organisms we get, the higher that proportion, the greater the risk of cancer treatment. That's just one example. Um, and we've identified seven particular threats. I mentioned C. diff, I mentioned CRE. Uh, there are others as well. Um, we think that we can actually substantially reduce the burden of these risks. In fact, you'll see this looks quite familiar to what I said earlier. Detection, response, prevention, and also innovation for new diagnostics and new treatments. Uh, we have a proposal in FY15 uh, to accelerate the detection uh, and response to drug-resistant infections and to improve uh, infection prevent, uh, prevention and antibiotic prescribing. We think that between about a third and a half of antibiotics used in this country are either unnecessary in the first place or are inappropriately broad spectrum. So we have a long way to go to improve our own prescribing practices. Um, and we can begin to address the gaps that can reverse drug resistance. Uh, in fact, we think we can make significant progress. We think we can cut C. diff and CRE by 50 percent 
over a five-year period. And that's not just a guess. That's what the best performing systems have already done. That's what other countries have already done. And we know how to do it. What we don't have are the resources to do it at scale. In fact, uh, we estimate that if we have this kind of multi-sectoral intervention, over five years we can prevent over 600,000 multi-drug resistant infections and over 37,000 deaths and save nearly $8 billion in healthcare costs. These are two lines. One, if we keep going as we've always gone. The other, if we implement intensively and aggressively. Antibiotic stewardship is one of the key areas. Um, it requires commitment, leadership, tracking. We now recommend that every hospital in America have an antimicrobial stewardship program. We think it has tremendous benefits for the facilities. It also is a win-win. It saves money and it saves lives. The National Healthcare Safety Network, operated by CDC, now includes virtually every hospital in the country, plus dialysis facilities and outpatient surgical facilities. Uh, an increasing number of facilities report electronically, and we've had a very productive collaboration with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services to use this information to feed back to hospitals and payers and encourage rapid progress. But antimicrobial resistance is a time bomb, and we've got to stop it before it gets too late, before the routine infections that we all could get tomorrow are not easily treatable. We've got to preserve the antibiotics that we've been using for our kids and our grandkids, because the pipeline is not full of new drugs about to come out. We hope new drugs will come out, but unless we improve systems of using uh, uh, the uh, antibiotic agents today, we could lose those as quickly as we've lost these. And I think with that, I'll, I'll stop and uh, look forward to taking any questions that you have. honored you're with us. Your time is so, so uh, valuable. And we have a, a packed house both here and, and outside. So we'd love to really take the time to have a little bit of engagement with the audience. So people could just raise their hands. We have microphones. This is being recorded. So wait till the mic comes to you. And I'll hand this back to you and see if I, we can. I don't think I need oh, it. You okay, need okay, it, good, but good. I don't. Thank Great. you. We have a question right here. Microphone? There's a woman right you, You've there. got the microphone, yeah. I think. There you go. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hi, I'm Jean Marie Ellican. Um, I work for Senator Casey's office. I just had a quick question about um, hospital preparedness in um, America. I remember the last briefing you discussed PPEs and mass production of that, as well yeah. as just like hospital preparedness and staffing. Could you just briefly describe a little bit more, like how ready do you think these like individual hospitals are all over America? I, I think you have to divide hospitals into several different groups. There's a highly specialized group that uh, needs to be able to care for a person who may have Ebola. For those hospitals, CDC sends a uh, uh, rep team, the Ebola preparedness assessment team, to see if they're ready and to help them get as ready as possible. In fact, any time there would be a uh, highly suspected or confirmed case of Ebola, we send a CERT team, CDC Ebola response team, with a team of specialists in infection control, clinical care, environmental uh, waste management issues, contact tracing, communications, to deal with uh, the situation. That team actually went to Bellevue before Dr. Spencer was diagnosed, uh, when he first admitted, was admitted and was ill. Uh, so there's a specialized, smallest group of hospitals that have to be ready to deal with uh, serious infectious disease threats such as Ebola. Uh, more broadly, there are hospitals around the country that need to be ready to assess patients if they come in and may have an infectious disease such as Ebola. We do expect that travelers from parts of the world that have had uh, Ebola outbreaks get sick. They're going to get flu. If they didn't take their malaria prophylaxis, they might get malaria. So they have to be assessed safely. But every hospital in the country needs to be ready and thinking about what do I do if someone comes in and there might be a concern for Ebola? That's why CDC issued uh, guidelines for emergency departments of what to do if someone comes in. And that's why there's uh, such appropriate interest in ensuring that we have training, drills, and information for healthcare workers on the front lines. Let me take a moment also to recognize Secretary Sebelius. Thank you for joining us today. I um, wonder if you wanted to make a, a, any comments at this point? Would you want to 
Maybe let me pass. He is the expert. <laughs> okay, well, we're really grateful that you're here with us. Let's see, questions? Right here, this gentleman right here. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael Chet. I'm an emergency physician in Maryland. And uh, needless to say, Ebola has changed the way we do business over the last couple months. Um, I've worked in several hospitals throughout Maryland, and one thing has struck me is the variety of approaches that each hospital has taken on how to prepare the employees for Ebola. Um, it, for example, I've gone through PEP training, the protective equipment training, at several different facilities. And the equipment I use, how I apply it, how, to, how I remove it, how I'm um, cl cleansed afterward is entirely different depending upon the facility. Um, so I want to ask you about that because it, it's surprising to me that there's not more um, consistency. And the second thing, uh, I've also been surprised by how available the CDC has been. There is that 24-hour hotline and not infrequently we call it with a patient with a fever in the middle of the night who, who rules in, as it were, from a risk perspective, and how available they are. Within two hours, I think, there's a response. And they'll, they'll appear in remote, our remote hospitals. Uh, people from the CDC will come in and screen these patients. So that's very impressive to me. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, perhaps you could uh, respond to the first point. Sure. Well, I, I hope it doesn't surprise people that CDC is there 24-7. <laughs> uh, but we can't be everywhere. And what we, what we do is to provide information, resources, consultation, uh, uh, not just for Ebola, but for infectious disease and other health threats. There is uh, not sufficient PPE for every hospital to have an unlimited quantity today. And that's why uh, what we've done is to allow several options. Uh, different facilities use different formats of PPE, and so our guidelines allow several different confirmations. But the principles of the <coughs> guidelines are very clear, and that's what every hospital should ensure. One is that healthcare workers should practice and practice and practice so that they're comfortable putting on and taking off the protective equipment. A second is that the, the putting on and taking off, particularly taking off of protective equipment, needs to be protocolized, routinized, in a very standard way and needs to be directly observed so that a trained observer is watching guiding and providing a checklist as each step is undertaken so that it's done with consistency. Not because Ebola is so terribly infectious, but because the stakes are so high. Uh, and we think it's very important also to have a site manager if there is an Ebola patient to do that kind of oversight and also the overall oversight of care so that you're monitoring every aspect of uh, care from beginning to enter, from entering, when you're in the treatment area and as you uh, leave the treatment area. So all of those are critical control points. All of those are places where we want to ensure that there's everything done to minimize the risk of infection. In the back there. And Dr. Frieden, thank you very much for coming today. My name is Melissa Goldstein. I'm a professor of medical ethics and public health law at George Washington University. As you can imagine, both of my fields are very excited in not so great ways all the time about this. I wanted to uh, ask you a question specifically in the ethical field and uh, following up on hospital preparedness. On October 20th, a very prominent bioethicist published an article questioning whether individual hospitals should perform CPR on Ebola patients and recommending that when Ebola patients come into the hospital that they perhaps automatically be uh, categorized as do not resuscitate patients. And I'm wondering if you have any comments on that. Well, wow. uh, <laughs> wow. You know, I think you sometimes have to go back to first principles. We want to get the risk of Ebola to zero in the U.S. The only way we're going to do that is by controlling it at the source in Africa. If we control it at the source in Africa, we're not going to have to face that kind of very difficult dilemma here. If we don't control it at the source in Africa, and it spreads to Mali and other countries, then we may have uh, a real challenge in the future. And that's why we'll want to make sure that when patients who may have Ebola are admitted, we can rapidly assess them and then treat them appropriately. In the US, we've had patients severely ill with Ebola. Um, as you know, uh, two of them have died, one today, despite maximal treatment. But we've also had patients who've survived 
with very intensive support, uh, including uh, kidney replacement therapy, including uh, mechanical ventilation, including very, very substantial support. So we want to provide the best possible care in the safest possible way. Good. There was a question over here, and then. Thank you, Dr. Frieden. Ellen Carlin with Bavarian Nordic. Two questions for you. The first is, as you know, medical countermeasure development and production is in high gear. What role do you see any successful candidates that are fielded playing in the current outbreak? Or do you see this outbreak finally being solved just through the more traditional public health measures that you described? Secondly, I'm a veterinarian and I'm interested in your opinion on an issue that um, those, those of us who are policy-minded veterinarians are discussing now, which is the, the relative lack of attention being paid to the zoonotic nature of Ebola, the potentially zoonotic nature of Ebola, not to mention other infectious diseases, and we don't tend to think about that in our preparedness planning. So if you could speak to that as well, I'd appreciate it. Sure. First, in terms of technological innovation, uh, I think we have the potential to have some innovations that are important in the current outbreak. We can't promise that. We can't count on them. We have to assume they won't be there and maximize our current tools. But there are at least two or three things that I think are quite promising. Uh, the, the one that may be closest to within reach, though you can't predict the future, are rapid diagnostics. There are at least a half a dozen companies fairly far along. Uh, the Navy has a product that's encouraging where we might be able to do in Africa a test in the field at the point of care and have results within half hour to an hour. That would make a really big difference. We've got a good test for Ebola, but it's a real-time PCR. It's easy to cross-contaminate. It requires a laboratory that's highly specialized. And we've been very creative at creating mobile labs the arm, that armed forces have, and we have at CDC also, and deploying those in Africa. But that's a far cry from being able to hike in four hours to a diamond mine and take out of your pocket something that can uh, confirm or uh, determine that something isn't Ebola in less than an hour. And that would make the kind of outbreak detection and control measures that we need easier. I'm guardedly optimistic that in a few months we may have something that works well enough to be used in the field. It may not be as sensitive as the real-time PCR, but even if it had a, a slightly lower or even a moderately low sensitivity, it would be very useful to rule in Ebola, a negative test wouldn't rule it out, but it would be very helpful for the management of outbreaks. So diagnostic tests, I think, at least for uh, symptomatic infection uh, at the point of care, I think can, can be brought uh, to bear in the current outbreak. Second is a vaccine. We have two vaccine candidates. Both of them work well in animal models. Uh, we're now assessing implementation of two different clinical trials of vaccines. NIH has the lead on one most likely to be done in Liberia, which will be a randomized clinical trial. The CDC has the lead on the other, uh, most likely to be done in Sierra Leone. That would be an adaptive trial called a stepped wedge design. Stepped wedge designs can get the answer quicker, uh, but uh, aren't as definitive as the randomized control trial, which may be more difficult to do, more complex to do, and may take longer. So I think these are two very complementary approaches. They're both necessary, and I'm hopeful that uh, we might be able to find effectiveness of one of the vaccines perhaps by the middle of next year, and that might still, uh, I'm afraid, be in time to be used in this outbreak. Uh, we're also looking at therapeutics and what are some things that can be done to improve outcomes. Uh, I think it's important to think of therapeutics that can be used to improve outcomes in the setting where most of the patients are treated and getting that, those settings upgraded and provided with effective care as rapidly as possible. Um, let me take a moment to ask a question. Uh, oh, I see one in the back. Go ahead. So back on that question, if and when we do. Thanks. I'm Natasha Bellamoria from Gavi. And I'm just curious, just to piggyback on that conversation, that question, um, if and when we do get um, a viable vaccine, what um, actions and thoughts is the government putting into actually getting that manufacturing out at a large scale so that it can actually have an impact you know, maybe on this, ep this epidemic, but in future ones as well. So BARDA in particular, the uh, agency responsible for bringing new uh, 
new vaccines and other uh, technological advances to the field is working very actively on this issue, as is the Defense Department and others. I think if we had a vaccine, if it were effective, we would consider using it in at least two different contexts. One of them would be uh, providing uh, for healthcare workers so that they would have a reduced risk of infection themselves. The second would be vaccinating uh, when, where there are clusters, community-wide, to try to kind of ablate the cluster, stop the spread in individual areas. And our staff who have now been from working for many months in Liberia say that in many ways this, the, the response reminds them of other outbreak responses where you're, you're seeing not a wildfire, but many, many, many bushfires. And being able to go into each one of them and, and cool it down and control it and save people's lives and prevent spread to others, uh, there may be a role for a vaccine there. But we don't know that. And uh, early on in vaccine work, there are things that are promising that don't pan out. There are things that may be promising, but even potentiate infection. So we, we just don't know what role vaccine will have, and that's why the trials are so critically important. We're trying to get them off the ground as fast as humanly possible. And I'll say that we've been very encouraged by the, uh, by the reception that we're getting in both Sierra Leone and Liberia, with the countries being very committed to moving fast and forward on this um, just as quickly as possible. Um, let me take a moment to ask you a question about health workforce. Um, I think, you know, the statement, a health threat anywhere is a health threat everywhere. Um, perhaps many are shocked by the lack of capacity in countries like Liberia and Sierra Leone. But, you know, uh, Secretary Sebelius is aware of a global code of practice around health worker migration and various efforts around health workforce and health system strengthening that, frankly, are very, very under-resourced. I mean, you've had Tony Blair himself working in Sierra Leone for almost seven years, very intensively with the Ministry of Health to build the capacity there, yet the capacity is not there because the, um, the level and density of health workers is so profound. Do you think that this crisis has woken up the world to the need to move more resources towards that? And what is the CDC doing in that regard? Well, I hope it, it wakes the world up. I hope at least uh, we get commitment from Congress over the coming month to support the kind of efforts that we want to do at CDC. We have a pyramidal model of epidemiology training that has three levels. At the most basic level, we can train any health worker to recognize and report uh, illnesses, infections, Ebola or other, so that we're beginning to get more accurate information in a more timely way. At the middle level, we can train over a several month period uh, people who are working at the district or county level so they can understand those reports that are coming in and take appropriate action based on them. And at the apex or highest level, there's that two-year epidemiology training program where we're training people to actually work independently. Each of the three countries uh, in West Africa, well, particularly Sierra Leone and Liberia, not only started out with many fewer healthcare professionals per capita and a very underdeveloped public health system, but has also had to suffer through the deaths of hundreds of doctors and nurses and other healthcare workers from Ebola. So they're really greatly challenged and responding there, building human capacity, understanding that we're not gonna have as many doctors and nurses as we wish. We're gonna continue to uh, create them, and train them and support them, but we're going to need to use a wide range of community health workers, lay health workers, uh, midwives and upgrade their skills, upgrade their knowledge and capacities so that they can respond at the community level to what's most needed. Mm -hmm. Good. Please, Secretary Sebelius, let's bring you a microphone right here, one second. Would you mind just standing for a sec? Thanks. I'm just prompting you to talk about another of your favorite topics. Um, you might talk a little bit about, um, as a follow-up to Peggy's question, the, the, what you feel about the knowledge that anybody has about in-country capacity and um, how helpful it might be to have some sort of a global measurement so that as something happened from afar, the World Bank or WHO or somebody else could say, well, that country is equipped and ready and this country clearly isn't. That's a great idea. Um, with uh, global health security, there are a clear set of capacities. Uh, can a country find the five most serious infectious disease threats in at least 80% of the country. Mm -hmm. Does a country have surveillance, uh, syndromic surveillance for things like um, viral hemorrhagic fever or other conditions? Do they have one trained epidemiologist per every 200,000 people, 200, people? Do they have an emergency operations center that can 
marshal and operate within two hours. Those are knowable things, but they're not currently known systematically. And we've now worked with a coalition of uh, more than 30 countries on the global health security agenda to agree on a set of action packages in each of the areas of prevention, detection, response, and to ensure that we are putting into place a system that can objectively monitor them independently. Whether that's the World Health Organization or a non-governmental organization uh, is not yet determined, but I think the world deserves to know if country X or country Y has systems in place. The World Health Organization has established this type of monitoring system in other work that it does, but has not yet done this in the international health regulations area, which is uh, so intimately related to the global health security work. One of those areas is in zoonotic disease, and I remember that I now forgot to answer your second question back then. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and that is, uh, are we really tracking where Ebola came from? Mm -hmm. This is one component of the global health security work, is reducing the risk of spillover events from the animal kingdom to human populations and understanding the spread of those events. And that's an area in which USAID has the lead. They've had for many years funding from Congress to study this and to understand it better. We do some work in this area with our laboratory work and our disease detectives. We sent people in to a cave in Uganda called Python Cave. Uh, I've been there. It has an enormous python in it. And it has <laughs> tens of thousands of bats. Uh, uh, we now know that 5 or 10% of the bats are infected with the Marburg virus, which is very much like Ebola, um, except that it didn't have a movie made out about it. Um, and the, we had our, our, our staff went into this cave uh, to sample the bats and try to understand the ecology of Marburg virus in Uganda a couple of years back. And I, I said to them, you know, weren't you scared? I mean, you've got this huge python, you've got 10,000 bats, a lot of them have Marburg, and the guy said, well, the, the bats didn't scare us because we, you know, we had our moon suits on, and the python didn't scare us either. But what did scare us were the cobras. <laughs> um, there were cobras at the bottom of the cave, and so underneath our moon suits, we wore leather chaps up to our waist so that if we had a cobra strike, we wouldn't uh, be killed by it. So some of the work in this, uh, in this zoonotic <laughs> disease work is a little challenging, but it's very important because we need to understand the, the cycle of how disease spreads. And we need to have some practical ways of addressing it. I spoke with the First Lady of Guinea in, in, in detail about this. She's actually from the forest region in Guinea, which has been the epicenter of the outbreak and where there's a lot of resistance, where the disease first emerged, probably from either uh, contact with bats, that we don't yet have proof that Ebola is uh, in the bat population. We have proof for Marburg from that study that I just described, but not uh, for Ebola, or from uh, bushmeat, animals, whether uh, primates or others, animals living in the forest, and people who hunt and kill bushmeat uh, may get infected, not so much in the consumption of bushmeat, but in the, uh, the, uh, the hunting and the cleaning. Uh, where they may get infected. So we still don't know what the source was here, which means that even if we stop this whole outbreak, it could happen again the next week if we don't find out how it happened this time and stop it. So that's very important work. The FAO is working on that. USAID, as I mentioned, has the lead for that. It's one of the critical components of the global health security work, and it's why it's so important that Congress funds all three of the components in the emergency funding request not only the domestic preparedness, not only the stopping Ebola in West Africa, but the global health security work more broadly. We'll take one more question. Rachel. Rachel Strecker with GHD at Aspen. Um, I was struck when you said that um, there are a lot of CDC workers who we were being pulled away from other projects um, to fight Ebola. And I was wondering whether on some level, you saw this as a net loss for these other infectious diseases that are happening because attention is being taken away, or whether perhaps there's increased health inf infrastructure because of this. Well, it's both, actually. Uh, um, uh, it is true. We usually have about 20, 30 people working on Ebola at CDC. Today, we have about 850. Um, and uh, the other 800 were doing other things before, and that's another reason 
the supplemental request is so important, the emergency funding request is so important, so that we can make sure that we can do both that which we have to do for all of health, whether that's flu or MERS, we just had a team go to Saudi Arabia for a cluster of MERS there, or other infectious disease or anything else in our portfolio. So the longer this goes on, the more challenging it is to keep uh, all parts of CDC protecting the public the way we're committed to doing. Uh, at the same time, the longer it goes on, the more we are able to build the capacities in West Africa, in the US, in other countries that will be useful not only for Ebola, but for the next Ebola or the next SARS or the next MERS or even the next HIV. And I think to leave you really with one thought, think of what a different place the world would be today if decades ago we had had basic surveillance systems in place, basic response systems in place. We had recognized HIV when it first emerged in Africa and stopped it, even without a vaccine, even without treatment, contained it. And we wouldn't have had 30 million deaths. We wouldn't have had 30 more million people already infected. Uh, we have so much that we can benefit from this. Uh, the systems that could have found and stopped this outbreak in West Africa cost a tiny fraction uh, what the response is going to cost. And it would be a, a very uh, unfortunate if we didn't at this moment both stop Ebola and prevent this country from having vulnerability, but also put in place the laboratories, the disease detectives, the response capacity that will find, stop, and prevent the next health threat. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.